Sometimes I get all fired up about these sermons. And unfortunately, I know you claim I shouldn't, but I, I stick way too much Scripture. So we'd be here all night with me commenting to you. But we'll give this one a go and see how it works. I titled it Second Violin. Uh, I'm going to have to explain a little bit to you. Let me see if I can get this. I'd rather use this. Let me see. So I don't have to turn my back to you. There. Perhaps you don't know much about the setup of an or a big orchestra. But over here in this area are the first violins. They actually carry the melody of any song. And over here in this section are the second violins who carry the harmony of the song to you. And so most people, especially young people, as they play, they put her, are put here into the second violin section first and see if they're any good. And then eventually they're moved over to the first violin section. And so I titled this lesson, Second Violin. And I wanted, I, I, we spoke to you earlier in John 3, I spoke to you Wednesday night and said I was going to use this material for this lesson. And I'd like for you to start reading with me in John 3. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing. Kids, by the way, I want you to take notes tonight, but I only want you to get the headlines on the charts. Okay? Otherwise, it'll be too much. Because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put into prison. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives this testimony and sets his seal to this, that God is true for God, whom he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son is eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains in him. The remarkable thing about John is that he was willing to play second violin. He was willing to take a back seat. He was willing to be number two and wasn't aspiring to be number one. Now that's really hard for people. <clears throat> I wanted you to look at some, first of all, as we think about this, some men who could not play second violin. And this is one of the passages, one of the areas where I just wrote down too many notes. The first one of these men that I want to discuss with you is, uh, if I can get this up, here we go, I think, maybe, here we go, is King Saul. So, that what Alan read it to you a moment ago. He said to, uh, oh, maybe if I turned it on, it would start working. He said to his son Jonathan, he said, we've got to do away with David because otherwise he's going to take away our place and our nation. And so you need to be against David. 
But Jonathan was willing to take second violin. He was willing to take a back seat. Saul wasn't. His pride wouldn't let him do it. I preached another sermon years ago to you called The Madness of King Saul. Saul could easily, he could easily have sort of retired. He had farmland back up there in his native country. He had been a farmer before. He undoubtedly had some wealth as a result of being king. He could have said, look, God's chosen you, David. You go ahead. I'll help you all I can. I'll help you make the transition. I'll fight for you. I'll help lead the people. But he wouldn't do that. Why? Because he wanted to be number one. And he couldn't take the lower position at all. You know, we also read of a fellow in the New Testament who had the same thing. It's over in 2 John, or excuse me, 3 John, where John says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. And not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. He that doeth evil hath not seen God. Diotrephes couldn't take a back seat. He couldn't take some lesser position. He had to be sort of the, the bull of the woods, the main character. And it's important that we learn to take that back seat. You might notice some others, Ananias and Sapphira. And this is kind of subtle, I think. In Acts 4 and verse 34, many of the Christians were contributing to the needs of the saints. And they were selling their property and giving it away, giving the money to the church. And Barnabas, at the end of chapter 4 and verse, uh, this is probably 37 or 36, Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyphus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And right after that, we read, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, and bought, brought a certain price, pro, bought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price? Now, maybe they couldn't afford it. Maybe they couldn't afford the loss that would be involved in the sale of this land. And so they wanted to keep part of the money. They needed it maybe to live on. But they didn't want to take a back seat to all the others. They didn't want to take a back seat to Barnabas. They didn't want to play second violin. Because Barnabas had sold a lot of land apparently and generously had given all of that. Maybe he could afford it. Maybe they couldn't. But they wanted to lie about it so that they would be right up there with all the other big givers. A lot of people can't play. Oh, I just, <laughs> I wish I could read you this whole thing. This is the king of Tyre. It's spoken of in Ezekiel. He says, first of all, we know this is the king of Tyre. It's in Ezekiel 28, beginning at verse 11. And I just can't read the whole section to you because I'm going to read two passages about him. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. Thus saith the Lord of God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of the tablets and thy pipes was prepared in those, to, uh, to in those thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, 
And I have set thee so. Thou wast on the holy mountain of God. He said, I set you up. But he failed God. He couldn't give up his position. He persecuted the Israelites. Fought against them. He just couldn't take a second position. The same thing is talked about in Isaiah, the 14th chapter, as it speaks of Tyre and its pride. They just couldn't go underneath. You might think of Caiaphas in the New Testament. Don't you remember what he said in John 11, verse 45, beginning? This is after the resurrection of Lazarus. When you can imagine, it was a tremendously popular event. Everybody wanted to talk to Lazarus. He had been raised from the dead. He had been dead three days. So, then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. Now they knew he was doing miracles. They knew he was from God. John 3 says they knew it. If we let him have alone, all men will believe on him. Oh my goodness. We won't be popular. He'll be popular. Do you know how many people have erred and sinned? out of a desire to be popular and the most popular. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. These men would still have been wealthy. They would have still been influential. People would have still listened to them. All they had to do was convert to the man they knew was from God who was doing miracles. They could be his disciples as well as anybody else. But they couldn't play second fiddle. They couldn't play second violin. They couldn't humble themselves. You might also notice the mother of James and John. Ooh, this started a stir among the disciples. This is in Matthew 20, verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him, desiring a certain thing of him. He said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. They wanted to be number one, or at least she wanted them to be. The other disciples got angry about it. I, many of my grandchildren have played sports. They played a lot of sports. You know, Little League and that sort of thing. Do you know what the common gripe is among so many of them? The coach, the coach's kid. There's probably poetry about the coach's kid. <laughs> the coach of this sports team, whichever it is, whether he's good or bad or indifferent, always is in the game. There's other kids better than him sitting on the bench. But the coach's kid is in the game. The coach seems to think that's the price for his coaching the team, is that his kid gets to be number one. If he's playing baseball, he gets to bat number four. If he's playing basketball, he's got to be the star. Everybody else gets yelled at, but not him. What's the matter? He can't let his kid play second fiddle. The mother of James and John couldn't do it either. She wanted them to be number one. A lot of people have trouble playing second violin. You need to remember that others are first. You know, somebody's commented, the greatest joys in life are found not only in what we do and feel, but also in our quiet hopes and labors for others. Philippians 2, and I, I found a new translation. This thing's pretty wild, but it's in pretty well common English, so you can get the point. 
If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, this is Philippians 2 verse 1, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Don't you like this? This is sort of plain. Think of yourselves in the way Christ thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that, the crucifixion. Jesus was willing to play second fiddle. He was willing to humble himself. In Luke 14, verse 7, Jesus went on to tell a story to the guests around the table, noticing how each had tried to elbow into the place of honor. I like this translation. I haven't read it all, so I'm not guaranteeing it, but I like the things I quoted. When someone invites you to dinner, don't take the place of honor. Somebody more important than you might have been invited by the host. Then he'll come and call out in front of you, uh, call out in front of everybody, you're in the wrong place. The place of honor belongs to this man. Red-faced, you'll have to make your way to the very last table, the only place left. When you're invited to dinner, go and sit in the last place. Then when the host comes, he very, may very well say, friend, come up to the front. That will give the dinner guest something to talk about. What I'm saying is if you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you're content to be simply yourself, you'll become more than yourself. You have to learn how to play second fiddle. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Ooh, this is good. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Love doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. And here's what I wanted you to notice. Is it always me first? Doesn't fly off the handle doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God's all, trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks back but keeps going to the end. Oh, I meant to put this up here so you could read along with me, I'm sorry. You need to be content to help and encourage people. You know, another quote I read is, it's amazing what we can accomplish if we don't care who gets the credit. Boy, everybody wants to be sure they get credit. In Romans 16, verse 3 and 4, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my, own, my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles, my helpers. Now, since you're in Romans 16, look at how many times he says that. In verse 9, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. In chapter, in verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow. Now, by the way, that's the same word. And Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen, salute you. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 6, he says, I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. 
Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. We are laborers together with God. You're God's building. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. Look with me in 3 John. No, I'm here. I'm good. <laughs> I've planted. Oh, I read you that. Let's look at uh, 3 John 1. Beloved, thou doest faithfully what thou, whatever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. We ought therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. We have an obligation to help others, to encourage them. Are we doing it? Or are we all about me first? You know, being second violin takes as much practice, takes as much diligence. You go through the same lessons, the same exercises, the same years of play as the people playing first violin. It's the same. Somebody said second violinists are first class musicians. Don't lose sight of that. I, my, I played violin when I was young. It was a great joy to me. I had a wonderful teacher. And when I got to high school in the ninth grade, we had 9 through 12 in my high school. I got to play in an orchestra. It was wonderful to have an orchestra playing around you and be in the middle of it. I don't know about bands. Jonathan can tell you about that. But have an orchestra playing around you and to hear that music vibrating through your very bone is wonderful. And I played second violin, and it was still wonderful. Unfortunately, my folks moved my <laughs> 10th year. And I had to uh, give up my musical career. Another quote, playing second fiddle may connote being second best, but the preparation for playing first and second violin is exactly the same. I want to read a poem. Too. I'm going to read a couple of poems tonight, so be patient with me. This is by John Milton. You'll notice... Nobody ever quotes this poem except the last two verses, and you'll be aware of it. Milton went blind, I think at the age of 23. And he says, when I, this is on his blindness. I don't think he titled it that. It was just titled for him in the next century. When I, this is the 1600, when I consider how my light is spent, his eyes were going blind. Ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent, which is death to hide, lodged with me useless. He couldn't read. Writing would be hard, though my soul more bent. To serve, he says, I wanted to serve there with my maker and present my true account lest he returning chide. Does God exact day labor, light denied? He said, is God going to hold me responsible when I couldn't see? I fondly ask the patience to prevent that murmur soon reply. God does not need either man's work or his own gifts. He doesn't need you, John. He doesn't need you to be brilliant. He doesn't need you to write. He doesn't need you to express yourself. He doesn't need you. You need to believe in him and serve him as best you can. He says, they serve him, bear his mild yoke. They serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post or land and ocean without rest. 
they also serve who only stand and wait. You can be second best. You can be blind and be God's servant. You can be blind and believe in him and do your best. You know, we spoke about the importance of opportunities. You know, your opportunities may get limited. Your abilities may be limited. But you can still be a servant. In 1 Samuel 30, I'm just not going to read all this. You can start at verse 16. David has been in battle. They've attacked his home, his family. They've carried away a bunch of their wives and children, and he's fighting about it. It says in verse 17, David smote them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day. That was about 24 hours they were in battle. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, nor sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. But they had fought so long that he had to pursue them. And some of the men were so exhausted they couldn't go. So David had left them by the stuff while his men who were strong could go on after them. David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor, and they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. When David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial of those that went with David and said, Because they went not with us, we'll not give them aught of the spoil that we've recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. So we're going to give you your wife and kids, but not any of the spoil. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. With that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand? For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. They also serve who only stand and wait. You know, of course, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. Not all of them had the same ability. One man could handle ten talents, another five. and One could only handle one talent. The Lord expects us to do what we can with that one. Being second, being the one talent man isn't wrong. But acting as the one talent man did is wrong. Consider the roles that we face in life or we have in life. Consider the role of a wife. Do you know what the Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 18? It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper. Suitable for him. There's the role of a wife to be a helper to her husband. Is that a bad thing? You know, that gun to where it seems like a bad thing these days <clears throat> to play second fiddle to your husband. You remember the first violins play the melody, second violins play the harmony. They help. In Proverbs 17 and verse 17, friends love through all kinds of weather. And families stick together in all kinds of trouble. A friend. You know, so many times you'll see a beautiful young girl with maybe a not-so-beautiful friend. Is that bad? Is, is that friend who's not so beautiful, is she content with being a friend? 
I think we all are. We see a, <laughs> my wife and uh, several others I've talked to give credit to some friend in high school because, whew, without them, I'd have never gotten through algebra. <laughs> they helped me a whole lot <laughs> getting through, studying with me and so forth. A friend. What about being a disciple? You know, I've seen people who were elders and they simply couldn't stop being elders. I've seen men who were preachers and they couldn't stop being preachers. Deacons who couldn't step back. In John 15, verse 12, this is my command. Love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I am no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from my father. It's important to be a friend and a disciple. In Matthew 10 verse 40, we are intimately linked in this harvest work. Anyone who accepts what you do accepts me, the one who sent me. Anyone who accepts what I do accepts my Father who accepts, accepts who sent me. Accepting a message of God is as good as being God's messenger. Accepting someone's help is as good as giving someone help. This is a large work I've called you into. Don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. Give a cool cup of water to someone who's thirsty, for instance. The smallest act of giving or receiving makes you a true disciple, a true apprentice. You won't lose out on a thing. In Luke 6, in verse 37, this is that translation I mentioned. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life. You'll find life given back, but not merely given back, given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting is the way. Generosity begets generosity. He quoted a proverb, can a blind man guide a blind man? Wouldn't they both end up in the ditch? An apprentice doesn't lecture the master. The point is to be careful who you follow as your teacher. In Matthew 10, 24, disciples are not better than their teacher. Slaves are not better than their master. It is enough for disciples to be like their teacher. <laughs> and for slaves to be like their master. My mother always quoted a proverb to me to keep me humble. Most of the women in my life have spent their life trying to keep me humble, which is probably <laughs> with varying degrees of success. But my mother always said, a stream cannot rise above its source. Just remember that, John. <laughs> Are you willing to be a disciple? Not the head, not the leader, just a disciple. Luke 17, which of you, verse 7, which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him, bye-bye when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meet? It will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken. And then in verse 10, So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded, you say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. What about being an ambassador? Let's move on to that just a little bit. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. Now let me, let's get this picture. You're not Christ. You didn't die for us. You're an ambassador. You're playing second fiddle. You know, the ambassador that we send overseas to this country or that country, he doesn't get to act on his own. He gets to act as he's instructed, usually by the State Department. 
he has to seek instruction on all of his behavior with this other country. Well, we also are sheep. <laughs> Is it any wonder? You know, I've preached on sheep many times. Is it any wonder that we're called sheep? Sheep are not, they're not lions, they're not tigers, they're not even rams, they're just sheep. Docile, easily led, easily confused. We're sheep. Can you serve the Lord and realize you're just the sheep of His pasture? The sheep that are scattered and need to be gathered. In 2 Peter 5, verse 5, you who are younger must follow your leaders. But all of you, leaders and followers alike, are to be down to earth with each other, for God has had it with the proud and takes delight in just plain people. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. This is that second poem I mentioned. It's entitled Second Fiddle. The hardest instrument to play is second fiddle, so they say. Now I believe this is so. I've tried, but haven't mastered it, though. It takes more grace than pen can tell to play the second fiddle well, to softly play in harmony while others shine in melody. Nobody ever listens much to the harmony. At times we even pause and rest while others give their best. It takes more grace than pen can tell to play the second fiddle well. While others are honored so. You know, the orchestra leader is usually the first chair in the first violin section. She gets to stand up and vow all the time, or he does. She gets the honors. It seldom plays a grand solo. She gets to play the solos, or he does. Yet in the background, keeps its place, while others in the spotlights face. It takes more grace than pen can tell to play the second fiddle. The second fiddle complements all the other instruments, while faithful to keep time and tune is of great price and worth unknown. It takes more grace than pen can tell. Play the second fiddle well. The master looks for those who he can use in his great symphony. It is but a few can bend and blend on whom he always can depend. It takes more grace than pen can tell. Play the second fiddle well. I'm going to tell you a story my dad told me about his college days. He attended Freed Hardeman College for about four or five years, and it was only a two-year school. He was broke most of the time. But he had a class under a man who's famous in the church, H. Leo Bowles. Bowles was training young men to teach and preach, and he had a fellow in the class who was sort of back. And uh, one day he fussed at him. And he says, what's wrong with you? You can't preach. You can't sing, lead singing. What can you do? And the fellow responded, Brother Bowles, I can be a Christian. Are you willing to be a Christian? Come while we stand and sing.